Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the 31st Canitza lecture, year by year. After 31 years, uh, we are here again. And uh, uh, okay, so before to start, uh, I leave the word to uh, uh, the deputy director, Professor uh, Guidalberto Manfioletti. Please, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So on behalf of the director of the Department of Life Sciences, I welcome you to the 31st Canitza Lecture. Uh, so the Canitza Lecture is a conference aimed at a non-specialistic audience, which is organized and sponsored by the Department of Life Sciences of the University of Trieste to uh, commemorate the founder of the Trieste School of Experimental Psychology. So the first edition dates back to 1993, the year of uh, Kanitza's death. So the conference is uh, held annually and is given by a scientist of uh, international importance who has made special contributions to the study of cognitive processes. This year, the speaker is Phil Kelman of the University of Los Angeles, whom I thank for accepting our invitation. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the work they have done to host this event which is part of the celebrations organized to mark the 100th anniversary of uh, the University of Trieste in uh, 2024. And I thank you for participation, for your participation to this event. Okay, I move here co-organizer of the event. Yeah, okay. So uh, it's my task to introduce the speaker to you. And sometimes this is uh, easy, sometimes it's difficult. Uh, and this year, uh, it is difficult on one side because uh, Phil is not only a, an estimated colleague of mine, uh, he's also a friend or I, consider him a close friend of mine. Uh, well, a few days ago, he wrote me a message, a very short message uh, saying, uh, it was funny, to help you to introduce, me, he, to introduce me, here is my CV, my curriculum. And he sent me something like a 38 page long uh, curriculum. Uh, and he impressed me, really. It was uh, uh, something that still still I am studying. Uh, he accomplished during his career really an enormous amount of, uh, uh, of uh, objectives. And so my mind uh, went to the first time I met Phil, 40 years ago, I think exactly 40 years ago. It was 83. And uh, I, was, I was visiting Rutgers at the time to visit uh, uh, Irv Rock, who actually was the first cancer lecture speaker uh, in 93. And at some point, uh, Irv told me, well, you must go to Swarthmore College and meet Hans Wallach. Uh, Okay, I said, uh, I will go. Uh, I took a train, I went to Pennsylvania, I went there. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed very much the visit, not only because I met, uh, I had the opportunity to meet uh, this junt uh, of uh, uh, perceptual psychology, Valak, but also because I had the opportunity to meet a very young uh, research assistant. I think uh, he was a research assistant at the time there, uh, who told me about uh, 
his experiments in developmental psychology with Liz Spelke, who actually was also a Kanitsa, speak, Kanitsa lecture speaker years ago. Uh, and he told me about a study that then became a classic, a classic that you find in textbooks on developmental psychology, in, in textbooks on perception, because it is a basic piece of evidence about uh, the way uh, the competence about uh, seeing objects develops. Uh, maybe uh, Phil will mention uh, this piece of work uh, anyway. It's something so beautiful and so nice that if you will not mention, you should look in the textbooks and find about this this uh, series of experiments uh, done in '83 or published at least uh, in '83, 40 years ago. After that, uh, Phil did a lot in different fields in uh, perception mainly, and uh, he is well known. Uh, mainly for two, I, I would say, that's my interpretation, for two contributions. One, the formalization uh, of good continuation, of a principle, a classic principle, Gestalt principle of good continuation, uh, and he gave the name relatability to it, which raised also uh, criticism and discussions because it is a building block of the way we think now about uh, the transition between fragments to objects. And the other is this very notion of uh, identity of processing uh, behind different types of completion, the so-called identity theory, uh, which also uh, was criticized, but uh, it, it has been criticized because it is really uh, it's capturing a fundamental uh, point uh, of theorizing about the different ways of completion that we encounter in our phenomenal experience of objects. So I'm grateful for, to Phil for uh, having accepted our invitation and for having prepared uh, uh, a long talk about uh, uh, completion or about unification from fragments into objects that I think we will introduce people who never uh, heard about that problem uh, to a fascinating field and will also give to experts in the field who are here in Numerous uh, a systematic view of this area. I think uh, that uh, Phil is one of the few people who can systematize such an area because he gave uh, experimental contributions and he gave a lot of attention, a lot of thinking. He is a great thinker, a great writer, and uh, I'm really grateful for his participation to our event today. Thank you. Well, thanks to all of you for those introductory remarks, and thanks especially, uh, Walter, for those very kind remarks. And I am sorry I sent 38 pages. I got to compress that a bit. It's a great honor to be here and a pleasure to be here, um, and also to be part of a small part of the centennial celebration here. This is a wonderful university that has made enormous contributions. I know best in my areas in which, uh, in which those contributions are truly impressive. So it's really great to be here. I'm going to talk about some of the things Walter mentioned. I thought we would start, especially that given that we are uh, in, largely or in part a non-specialist audience, I just wanna show you a picture briefly, have a look. 
and now it's gone. And think about what was in the picture. I suggest that the inventory you have of what you've seen is mostly in terms of objects. You may recall a table, a chair, a blanket hanging on the wall, some wooden beams, a fireplace, you can just check, the lamps, forgot the lamps. Objects are fundamental in the way we comprehend reality. They're organizing elements of thought and action. They're basic to language and communication. A baby's first words that are learned are usually the names of objects. Now, we don't get to do this very often. We could stop for a moment and say, well, what is an object? Actually, philosophers do this a lot, and their definitions are far more expansive. An idea may be an object. So we're going to try to, to tame that a little bit. But along the way, are objects real? Are objects arbitrary ways we organize our experience? Or are they getting at something that's really out there? I'm going to suggest that objects are... I'm trying to turn on my pointer here. Yes, got it. Objects for our discussion will be bounded volumes of matter. An object is an ecological unit, which means that's special, but not arbitrary. From out in space, the planet Earth would look like an object, but it's not an object for our everyday human behavior. So objects tell us where the world comes apart and what will function as a unit. Objects for us are conditioned on scale and forces. What do I mean by that? Well, the planet Earth being not an object for us is an example. Objects have a certain scale in which we can interact with them, grasp them, move them. Uh, we don't deal with subatomic particles as objects in ordinary human life. Also the forces, how much an object holds together as a bounded volume of matter is limited. We can break something up with enough force, but in our everyday activities, a toothbrush is an object, a table is an object, a bowl of pudding, eh, not so much. If you pull on one part of it, the rest will not come. So by far, vision is our most important sense in object perception. It works at a distance because we can use reflected light. It's spatially the most precise. You can thank evolution for that and the capacities of reflected light that are exploited in our visual capabilities. And it's fast and efficient. You probably see 10,000 to 100,000 objects a day. A key difficulty in perceiving objects, however, and there are a number of key difficulties actually, but broadly I'm gonna to refer to a group of problems as the fragmentation problem. This comes from the fact that the world is three-dimensional, the receptor surfaces of the eyes is two-dimensional. It's a flat projection surface. Light moves in straight lines, and most objects are opaque. So the result is this. Now I've got good news and bad news. The bad news first. To recover this object, one has to, to and the object I'm talking about, because there are several, the object of the car, the car you see is perceived despite projecting light to the eyes in probably 30 or 40 different places, spatially separated on your retina. The fence is occluded by some leaves partly, the tree is occluded by the fence, the car by all of that, the roadway by the car and all of that. That's the bad news. There's a very difficult problem here. This is a real stumper for artificial intelligence, computer vision systems. But what's the good news? The good news is fairly obvious. You can see the car. So that's going to be a lot of what I'm talking, going to talk about today. So how are we able to see objects despite fragmentation? These are some of the most challenging problems in understanding perception. And they're important both for biological and artificial vision. But wait, it gets worse. When we move or objects move, we get changing patterns of occlusion. If we stop the image, you can see that the objects behind, or in this case, people, are just little color patches and they don't make much sense. So how do we put together reality when it's coming to us as little patches? 
Well, surprisingly, you can also see that motion is providing information. When it moves, you can see the people. And um, when it stops, it's harder. I'm going to try to give you that one more time. You can actually count the number of people back there when it moves. I'm going to refer to the general problem of seeing objects from fragments as object formation. And so, fortunately, we have sophisticated processes for doing this. Just as a brief introduction, broadly can divide these into contour interpolation and surface interpolation. Here are some, a nice set of examples. In the upper left, I'm going to suggest that the three separated black fragments are seen by you as one object connecting behind a gray occluder. That's what perception, perceptionists do in talks. They'll come and tell you what you're supposed to see. But actually, when I say that, it will always be something that we know experimentally as well. So if this is a unified object, there really are two kinds of information that are putting it together. One is a process of contour interpolation. And this is what we d disrupt down below, where we move those pieces. And the relations of the edges of those pieces, especially where they hit the occluder, where they go behind the occluder, that's really the difference between the coherent object here and the somewhat disrupted object here. However, you may still see the thing in the lower left as somehow completed, although with vague shape. And that's a surface completion process. Under occlusion, the, when things have the same color, and with certain constraints, such as a little bit constrained by where the edges are. But we can say, well, metaphorically, the surface spreads. So you may see these three black pieces as somehow connected in a blobby way without very precise boundaries. Now, remarkably, we can get rid of the surface process. And up here in the upper right, we preserve the contour process. And we still see a coherent object. The three different colors here frustrates the surface process, but we st you still may have an impression of a coherent hole in the upper right. And then finally, if we disrupt both surface and contour completion, that's the most dissociated these pieces will look. Arguably, you see three fragments and a gray occluder. The fragments don't end at the occluder. That's an important issue <clears throat> as well. It's such an honor to be here for a lecture named for Professor Kanitza. I met him once many years ago, and uh, he sent me holiday cards, handwritten some years after that, and I was very touched. In the important ways, Professor Kanitza put these issues on the map scientifically. Here's his classic, I doubt there's anyone in this audience who doesn't know the Kanitza Triangle a classic display. But he had many other variations that gave many insights. And one of my favorites is on the right in a 71 article. Beautiful footnote in the 71 article. Kanitza ponders what we should call these things. Uh, but let me say what the thing is first. Uh, it is that you see the edges of this triangle, or you see the whole circle here, despite the fact that along many of, much of these edges, there is no physical stimulus locally. There is no place where it's darker on one side and lighter on the other. So Kanitza thought, and I think very appropriately, we might call these contours without gradients, meaning no different properties physically on the two sides, or anomalous contours. At the time, he said, it's already been lost. They call them subjective contours. Uh, I think that's maybe one of the worst names, and it kind of went away. <laughs> We call them today illusory contours for better or worse. But you may think of them as anomalous the contours. <laughs> now, why do I say Kanitz's work put these issues on the map? Well, the issue of perceiving partly occluded objects, which is a pervasive one, was understood. And Michat, a Belgian psychologist, in the same spirit, I think, as Kanitz, uh, uh, talked a lot about that. But there's something about partly occ occluded objects that that is sort of uh, leads us to take them for granted. The house that you see in this bottom image is occluded by some trees, but you know there's a house there. And there's really a house there. But OK, we can't see all of it, but we'll kind of figure that out somehow. Kanitz's stunning contribution, not to discover the first illusory contours because they had been discovered, but the examples were not compelling ones. 
he, he learned enough about these, a great deal in fact, to make these stunning examples. The triangle is unmistakable. It's an object that just jumps out at you. And instead of knowing, well, the house is out there and we see part of it, here the triangle appears where pretty much there's nothing. It shows the active perceptual processes that construct these objects. Now, we're going to see later that it's probably the same process that constructs boundaries in these cases. But the illusory contours show this as an active process in a special way. <clears throat> However, with our orientation toward an important task of perception, finding the objects in the world from fragmentary information, we do need to ask, is there really nothing there? Well, could there be a triangle here? And under what circumstances? And the answer is yes, there could be. And the circumstances would be camouflage. If there really was an object there and it had the same surface properties, color and texture as the surround, then it might look just like that. So these are easily seen as part and parcel of a process that's recovering objects in the world. Sometimes they're in front and they're camouflaged. Sometimes they're behind and they're occluded. So as we'll see, there may be a close relationship between these. Uh, in this example, which you'll see again, uh, these two objects have the same physically given contours and the same gaps. On the left, the gaps are given by the occluder, and on the right, the gaps are given by empty space. And we'll exploit that relationship. Using terminology from Michotte and colleagues, these are called amodal completion and modal completion. We won't do much with those terms, although they're quite interesting today. But you can think about partly occluded objects as completion of an object that appears behind other objects or surfaces, and illusory objects as completed objects appearing in front. <laughs> OK, here's our agenda for the first part of this talk, which will be the longer part. A word about the approach. <clears throat> And I was told that there is a second part today that's a little bit more personal. So I took most of this part of the approach out and pushed it to later because that's where I'll, I might talk with you about my history in this field. But we do want to say a little bit about the approach and then some basics of interpolation processes in object perception, 3D and spatial interpolation, and then some recent work about intermediate representations that helps to resolve many anomalies and controversies. The approach. What should be the goal of research in these areas? How do we know if we're succeeding? <clears throat> well, as many of you know, modern research in visual perception is at a nexus of many disciplines, cognitive science, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, even medicine and philosophy. The methods vary, psychophysics, computational modeling, brain imaging, and so forth. Out of all this, what's a good question? What's a good method? What are we trying to do? The answer is actually we're trying to do lots of things. But for the work I'm going to talk about, there is a, a guide. And that guide is a scientific trajectory that begins with the Gestalt psychologists, continues through Kanitza, who I think would have considered himself a Gestalt psychologist, but was a bit later than Wertheimer, Kurler, and Kafka, Michat and Johansson, much in the same spirit. And then the work of JJ and Eleanor Gibson. And then finally, computational theorists like David Marr and even a philosopher of mind like Jerry Fodor. <laughs> now, let's be clear. These folks would not have agreed about all the points that I'm going <laughs> to say. So I'm culling from this several nice ideas. But they would have agreed on a lot. And I'll try to make that clear. <laughs> The study of perception should focus on relations and stimulation, not sensory elements. Perceptual processes and mechanisms, often products of evolution, extract these relations. We should study them. The outputs of perception are descriptions of meaningful properties of the world. They're not a sensory array. They're, they're, they're things like solidity and shape and arrangement. And some of the later people in this chain emphasize that we get explicit symbolic representations. I'd say abstract as well, and that will include the Gestaltists. 
symbolic abstract representations of objects, shapes, and special, spatial arrangements. Now, hopefully later, we'll get to say a word about why this is so important now as we are confronted with deep learning systems and uh, that do not do those things and might drive your car, but that's later. So the goal of the work is to specify relations in the stimulus input that produce perceptual outcomes and to characterize the processes that extract the information and the resulting representations of meaningful properties of the world. Let's start with contour interpolation. We're going to do, talk about interpolation processes in object formation. I'm going to make two apologies. <clears throat> First, for specialists in the audience, you knew this already. This is a long trajectory of work by us and by others. And second, scandalously, I'm going to present very little data in this part. But it's not that there aren't data. There's lots of data. But I need to get some basic building blocks out there. Contour interpolation is probably the fundamental process for connecting fragments across gaps. And it's especially responsible for shape. Contours define shape. Now, when I got started in this field, a little bit of history for this part. When I got started, the theoretical situation was in flux, to say the least. Maybe chaotic is better. Maybe it's still in flux, but I think it was more in flux back then. <clears throat> Some people said illusory contours were products of brightness contrast. So you see these little cutout parts of the inducing elements. Well, the black parts will induce locally some brightness contrast, make the white look a little brighter. And so a sensory theorist would say, oh, you don't need any highfalutin perceptual organization. There's some brightness contrast, there's some pools of it, and then a miracle happens, and you see the contours. On the other side, Richard Gregory, a famous perceptionist in the UK, called these cognitive contours. And beyond the illusory contours, partly occluded objects were thought probably by almost everyone to be cognitive, but not Mishat, by the way, and not Kanitsa. Some called illusory contours the solution to a problem. Well, these fragments, they're incomplete. They need to be completed. So it was very much in flux, but some, and we seem to gravitate toward this right away, considered these to be products of perceptual organization. Kanitsa was a leader of, of among those. As we got started, none of the explanations seemed very precise. Phenomena seemed lawful somehow, suggesting perceptual mechanisms. So we sought some geometric accounts where contour interpolation occurs and what contour relations support interpolation. <laughs> We also noticed very interesting similarities between modal and amodal uh, completion. Now here's an illusory square, a Kanitsa square, as it is known. I don't know if we were the first people to do this, but we were among the first people. I'm not sure where this traces. If you just draw in a couple of little lines here, notice that that square that was amodally completed in front of the black circles, how does it appear now? It still looks like a square connected, but it's behind the surface, the behind the white surface seen through windows. We've turned the holes, we've turned the black disks into holes. So this was a suspicious similarity. <laughs> we also discovered these transforms. You can take an illusory contour display and transform it into an equivalent occluded display. What do we mean by equivalent? Well, it will have the same physically specified boundaries and the same gaps given by occlusion in one and by empty space in the other. So here's a quick visual of how you do that. You take the original display, put the occluder over the gaps, switch the contrast of the, the, the central figure, and get rid of the inducing elements for illusory contours. Voila, you have a partly occluded object. And you can go the other way as well. So now we can ask, do we get the same perceptual outcomes when we have equivalent physically given edges and gaps in these two types of completion? People up to this time thought these were two different types of completion. And yes, there, as Walter alluded, there are a few people out there who still think that, but um, you'll, you'll get, we'll get a little bit of the treatment of why you might not want to think that. 
Another thing that was remarkably interesting to us were a class of displays studied by Petter, <clears throat> who I understand worked with Kanitza. These we have called self-splitting objects. In both cases, A and B, these are homogeneous black areas. When you look at them for a while, a funny thing happens. They split into two objects. So here you see a triangle and some quadrilateral. For now, we're only going to talk about the one on the left. You may notice as you look at it that sometimes the triangle's in front, sometimes the quadrilateral is in front. I'm going to argue later that our theory explains why this comes apart, and then we use a constraint that two objects can't be in the same place at the same time to help explain the depth ordering that's seen. And when we use other cues like stereoscopic depth, we, uh, we can do the same thing with the depth ordering. But this phenomenon intrigued us, no, no doubt, because when you split this into two objects, and one is in front and the other behind, note, let's say the triangle is in front. It will have illusory contours. It's modally completed. And the other object will be partly occluded, having amodal, hidden contours, but still perceptually real. When it switches, with perfect complementarity, the amodal contours become modal ones, if the quadrilateral is in front, and the modal contours become amodal. So this really intrigued us. OK, we're not talking fully about the identity of these yet. Let's start at the beginning. We looked with all these similarities for what they might have in common. The first thing is the initiating conditions for interpolation. What initiates putting together fragments? You know, the visual field is very complex. If you think of all the little patches of surface and so forth, even if you kind of group them by similarity of color or texture, which ones go with which other ones? So that's what this is about. Turns out the ty types of interpolation we're talking about always start with a feature, which we're going to call tangent discontinuities, but are more easily thought of as contour junctions. So these two circles show you two tangent discontinuities. Now, there are a bunch of contour junction types. These are called T's because if you look at the edges that intersect at this point, it actually forms a letter T. Here the T is rotated. These are L's, but they're also contour junctions. And what in the heck do we mean by tangent discontinuities? It means that there, these are points in the image where the contour has no unique slope. So that's because typically at a tangent, junk, a tangent discontinuity, more than one edge has met. You have a sharp corner. <laughs> Turns out that all partly occluded boundaries and illusory contours, with a few borderline exceptions, um, much of which, well, I don't want to go into to those things yet. But they begin and end at these points of contour junction. In fact, in partial occlusion, we were able to prove that whenever one object occludes another, partially, it will produce tangent discontinuities in the projection to the eyes. We pi piggybacked uh, off of some nice theorems that had been done before with objects that intersect. <clears throat> so there's an invariant in partial occlusion, but not in illusory contours, which means we can manipulate them. This is not a great slide, but you probably see these wispy illusory contours connecting these four pieces. Not too sensible of an object, but you might see these little edges. If we round them, it, they go away. I should have made a better slide. But here's maybe a better demonstration. If we look at these self-splitting objects that Petter studied, if you stare at this for a while, the X resolves into two rounded rectangles, one in front of the other. But if we round off this very subtle rounding of the junction points, this doesn't split. It really is possible to have a homogeneous black object that has a lot of articulated parts. It doesn't split into two objects. So these little guys are very important. So what edges connect in interpolation? I put together a little demo. Arguably, in the partly occluded display up top, you see two separated black pieces. They, they go behind the occluder, but it's not obvious that they connect. Below, you see something that is, isn't really making it as an illusory contour. Now, we can move them. So far, not so good. Then we get into a range where 
they do appear to be connected behind the occluder and they do form illusory contours. It's not just one location, it's a range, probably this still works. And then we're off, wait, and then we're off into separation land again. So we worked to discover some of the rules for this. And in the upper left, you see three displays of amodal completion. And to the right, three illusory contour displays. We call these relatable because they fulfill the mathematical requirements that we are able to formalize. In the bottom left, you see three cases where two black fragments don't seem to connect. And likewise, you don't get any good illusory contours in the bottom right. So what are these relations? I'm gonna spare you some algebra. The easiest way to think about this, what the visual system will interpolate to connect fragments is a smooth monotonic curve. That means starting, smooth means starting from agreement with the orientation of E1, edge one, the curve can bend in only one direction and join E2 agreeing with its slope there. On the lower left, we see an example where you could do that. And what are these little dotted lines? Turns out the easiest way to think of relatability is if these dotted lines are linear extensions of the input edges, and these edges are ending at points of tangent discontinuity in the, in the image, the edges are relatable when the two edges linear extensions meet in the extended region. So this is good, this is good, this is not good. What would you have to do to connect in the bottom right? You'd either have to doubly inflect to get a connection, or if you just draw a straight line from the endpoint of one edge to the other, you could do that, but you would introduce a sharp corner and at each place. So the visual system doesn't interpolate Tangent discontinuity. <clears throat> now, relatability was primarily intended to express a fairly categorical notion. There are gradations of relatability, but one of the tasks the visual system needs to figure out is when are things connected and which things are not connected. So it does a pretty good job of that. There are some other really important questions. One of them is, what is the shape of an interpolated contour? And we, we have a shape that's consistent with the form formulation of relatability that might be plausible, but this is a very hard question. I think the, some of the nicest work on this was done by Walter Gerbino and Carlo Fantoni in a 2003 paper. So they present their vector field combination model, but also do a terrific job of reviewing other approaches to this problem. I'm not gonna have too much to say about the shapes of contours, but I hardly, I, I mean, highly, <laughs> highly recommend that paper. Uh, briefly, neurally, can you implement this? Do we know anything about it? There's two main proposals of how you would implement contour relatability. One is you could have um, activations that go out from the oriented units that we have in early visual areas. By the way, this is very related to some work we're doing on contour shape, and it will, uh, it, some of it's published, some of it not. But the idea that oriented units have projections to others is a, um, is a good idea. It was proposed, um, among others, by Field, Hayes, and Hess, 1993. But as you can see with the solid lines, there are some connections that can form among oriented units and some that cannot. The dotted lines are no good. This perfectly maps the ideas of relatability. And maybe this is how neurally you do this. Each edge activates, uh, sends activation, and the activation goes out. And if it meets up with something else, it connects. The other way, which has been suggested by Grossberg and Mingala and nice work by Heitger, von der Heit, and so on, is that we have some bigger detectors that collect from spaced oriented units. Here we have two collinear ones. So if there's activation here and then down here, then they both go in here. And if it gets simultaneous inputs, it signals that the space in between has, um, should be interpolated. And a lot depends on the relations that you allow to feed in to those bigger units. <clears throat> Our own model, which interpolates for both illusory contours and occluded contours, which uh, these earlier models didn't, didn't do, is based very much on the Heitger von der Heit work. And you can see in this display, uh, if you see a quadrilateral here, 
it begins life here as a partly occluded object, a, a contour, and resumes in the middle to become illusory and joins here. And each connection among the four edges is like that. So that's a clue that these are very much conjoined in a single interpolation process. But um, neural models hadn't done that, so that's, a, that's a, an addition to them. Contour relatability has been shown, again, scandalously without evidence that I'm presenting today. Uh, in human modal and amodal completion, it's been extended to 3D and spatiotemporal completion, which I will talk about, especially spatiotemporal. And uh, to surface formation in 3D, in work that Carlo, Walter, and I uh, did. It's been found in non-human animals. And it has been argued to be a cognitive module. So the philosopher Jerry Fodor talked in the modularity of mind about cognitive modules. And what's really nice about a cognitive module is, well, it's probably innate or maturational, but it's also informationally encapsulated, meaning it's going to respond to very specific inputs in a very automatic way. Uh, Brian Kane, who, full disclosure, was my former student, has argued that, uh, and Brian Kane has a PhD in philosophy of mind with Jerry Fodor before he got a PhD in my lab. So he was a pretty good person to argue that this fits all the criteria as a cognitive module. What's the ecology of contour relatability? Why does it work? Well, we're trying to find connected objects in the world. It has been argued from studies of scene statistics by Geisler and others that object contours tend to be smooth. There are other smoothness principles in perception. The idea is that contours and surfaces tend to, ch to change gradually in the world. So I've always waffled on this. It might be that objects are smooth, or it might be if you're trying to make a best guess about things that aren't specified in the stimulus, smoothness is your best deal. So you could go either way. All right, the next building block, the identity hypo hypothesis. <clears throat> a number of interpolation phenomena, especially modal and amodal completion, share a common interpolation mechanism. We proposed this quite a long time ago. <clears throat> One thing that might make you think about that is you get nearly identical patterns of results for illusory and occluded transforms in numerous experimental paradigms. And that includes paradigms where we use objective performance measures. In other words, you're better at something, discriminating, classifying, if, you, if your visual system forms the connection. And also paradigms where people give subjective report. But there are also some reports of, I would say, modest differences. But we've said from the very beginning, you cannot decide whether there's a single interpolation process under here from empirical data. The reason is, on one side, modal and amodal completion could be different processes, but follow the same constraints. It's like analogy and evolution. And small differences don't necessarily mean they're not the same process, because there are things that are different about the displays that make amodal or modal completion. There are other surfaces that you need to do to get them to be one or the other. So there's always some, some difference. But I want to give you the flavor of what we've called logical arguments. My belief is that if you have a logical argument for something, that, that wins. Uh, so if, if somebody's data says, oh, they don't match perfectly, OK, well, find the source of noise because we have a logical argument. Um, <clears throat> I don't feel the field likes logical arguments very much. But anyway, in the, um, in the kind of displays we looked at before, Petter was especially interested in the kind, one on the right where two objects seem to be intertwined. I'm going to call these golf clubs. There's a shaft and there's a head. In each case, you may see the head of the golf club as being in front of the shaft of the other. How many see the head of the clubs in front of the shafts? Raise your hands. How many see the shaft in front of the head? How many see it reversing from time to time? OK, it's a pictorial display. It's not the strongest cue in the world, but it is very interesting. Arguably, let's take, if, if we have the empirical premise to a logical argument, if Petter is right that there is this tendency, what does it imply? Well, if these are crossing interpolations, which they are, and the one who gets to be on top as modal completion is the one that traverses the smaller gap, which is what Petter suggested, 
then this implies the system has the locations and extents of interpolation before it decides the modal or amodal appearance. And I recommend the idea that modal and amodal appearance are about the outcomes of perceptual processes. They're not characterizing different processes. Here's another example. I'm gonna ask you something that may be difficult. If you cross your eyes a bit and try to get the two X's to come together, a third X, a new X will appear in the middle. Try to get them to fuse as an X in the middle. And if you've done magic eye stereograms, which seem to be, have gone away, but if you've done those, that will help you. And if you can get that X to fuse in the middle, try to ignore the images you have off to the side, look at the central image and look above the X. And what you'll see is a rectangle slanted in depth. The rectangle's left edge comes out of the screen towards you. The right edge is far back behind the screen surface. And the two vertical lines, I'm gonna, two vertical um, segments, I'm gonna call those posts here for convenience. When the rectangle appears slanted, the left post is behind and it appears amodally completed. So there's crossing interpolations here, two of them. The right post appears modally completed in front of the slanted rectangle. Now, what does this imply? Well, in this display, the reason the rectangle appears slanted is something called depth spreading. Some people call it disparity spreading. It's not disparity, it's depth spreading. Um, anyway, because we used horizontal lines, there are no features along these lines that tell your left and right eye where something is in depth. So all the depth in this rectangle comes from the vertical edges and we've displaced them in the left and right eyes. So that gives you the slant, but depth spreading occurs within objects. It doesn't go all over the visual field. It's depth spreading that gets you the slanted rectangle. It's the slanted rectangle that gets you a modal completion of the post on the left, modal completion of the post on the right. But depth spreading only occurs within objects. So arguably, interpolation must precede depth spreading, which must precede modal or amodal appearance. By the way, if you, if you uh, fuse by diverging, it'll go the reverse. Now let's look at a very bad animation I tried to make. But if you can again fuse these, I've actually made it so this rectangle swings back and forth. And as it does, if you can keep it stable, when you cross your eyes, you'll see the modal and amodal completion status in those crossing interpolations with the rectangle, it changes. The only thing changing in this display are the vertical edges of the rectangle. Everything else is exactly stationary, nothing is changing. So this is maybe to activate this idea that it's the depth, it's depth at the edges gives rise to the depth spreading across the rectangle because it's a unified object. But then the posts are sitting there vertically. They have pretty good information in the visible parts of where they are in space. And the interaction of these ends up with a modal appearance for one post, modal appearance for the other. And as it transitions through, that, can, that changes. How many were able to get that to, to work? Perception distance, a few, okay. All right, I'm gonna skip that one. <clears throat> and finally, very interestingly, we found that modal and amodal completion can happen in the same edge interpolation. So this supports the idea that edge interpolation occurs and then the interpretation of where it is relative to other surfaces, at least in some cases, has to be a consequence of what else is going on. If you can free fuse these, if you can cross your eyes and get them to be one object, in the center. It will be more vivid, but it works with either one anyway. Um, but the object you see will probably have bent contours coming toward you. It's a little square that's bent out of the plane. So it's 3D. And these are all edges that begin as amodal and continuous modal. Okay. Relatability is not just a 2D notion. we were able to show that a generalization of this, the geometry, mainly a smooth monotonic connection, put more formally, of course, in 3D 
produces 3D interpolation. So interpolation is inherently, I think, a four-dimensional process. Three spatial dimensions and time, or motion, actually. So I'm not going to do much that's formal with this. We're going to skip some of this geometry. But if you imagine ran, or, edges oriented in arbitrary places in three space, the edges that can connect are ones that could join the edge, join the tip of one edge, bend monotonically, and smoothly join the other edge anywhere in 3D. So we did a lot of experiments on this. You can find them in an old psych review paper. But for today, just to keep us on track, I'm, I'm going to ask again that you try to cross your eyes and fuse this display. I do think this is the easiest or the second easiest one. So if you've had trouble, try again. Cross your eyes. Does anybody see rings slanted in depth? Yay, somebody. OK. So when you cross your eyes, you'll see that what we've given are 3D positions of the visible parts of the edges. And they produce beautiful 3D illusory contours that come out from the plane and 3D occluded edges that go behind. And if you're really expert at this, you can diverge and they'll switch. The ones that are illusory become uh, occluded. So when the edges uh, that your visual system gets are, are given good 3D orientation information, this starts the interpolation process in a fully 3D way. And here's another one. Get a little transparency in here. If you can cross your eyes, you might see a beautiful uh, rounded surface in depth. And it picks up some of the coloration spreads across there. OK. Now, as I mentioned very briefly, surface interpolation, which is only making cameo appearances today for us, in 2D is based on surface similarity. It's like, like color. Because there is no geometry. In 2D, everything's in the same plane. However, in 3D, surfaces like contours might have a geometry. So Carlo Fantoni, Walter Trebino, and I studied this by manipulating the relationship of small planar tabs viewed through apertures like this. And in fact, we found, we confirmed the idea that smooth monotonic connections puts these things together in a way that makes you better at an objective task. When your visual system completes surfaces or objects, there are measurable ways it makes you faster or more accurate at uh, certain tasks. Here, I think it was judging slant perception. But a cameo appearance is all I, I promise there. <clears throat> Let's spend a little more time on spatiotemporal interpolation. Really, our situation moving through the world or having objects move is quite complicated. Oh, let's see. It's even more complicated if your movies won't play. Help. Where's my movies? Oh, I'm sorry about this. One more try. Ah, OK, you ready? I was asked if I had audio in this talk. I forgot about this one. Oh, jeez. Wait a minute. Sorry, we're going to get this. Oh, that's heartbreaking. OK. Oh, I want to really want to play that. Oh, I am so sorry, that movie. Anyway, it's a beautiful fire truck going past trees with siren. Oh, well. Uh, anyway, you take my word for it uh, that you would. Oh, OK, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Don't give up. <laughs> OK. Now, here's what you get some of the fragments in some of these images. It's a mess. And e even worse, if you look at what one part of the eye sees at any given day, at any given time, hmm. well, I'm not going to fuss with this too much, but let me see if I can get it. In any one spot, oh, I might get it. OK, in one spot, what's happening overwrites itself continuously. Oh. Wait a minute. Sorry, I'm going to. OK. 
Watch what happens. Okay, all that information in one little spot. What a mess, what a jumble. How does a visual system assemble fragments across gaps in space and time? Well, our hypothesis here is that a similar geometry, the same geometry as contour relatability, might generalize to information over time. But you need two things. You need concepts of persistence and positional updating. And this is work done largely with Evan Palmer. So here's how it goes. <clears throat> In the left example, imagine an object that's not visible because it's behind this occluder passes Oh, I'm sorry, imagine the object is stationary and the occluder that's gray and has two windows in it moves to the left. At time one, you may get a visible part of an edge and an orientation. At time two, you get another one, but notice they're in different places. Oh, no, I'm sorry, this, this object is in the same place. So that's just persistence. If you can keep this ed edge in a brief visual storage, then when this edge appears, because the object itself didn't move, it's the occluder that's moving, you can perform contour interpolation. Indeed, it, it seems that your visual system does exactly that. So that's persistence. On the right is the moving object. If you have the moving object, not visible, dotted lines, and then part of it appears through one window, and then at a later time, it appears through another window, these two are certainly not relatable in those two windows. But a, an idea of positional updating, if your visual system actually takes a visible fragment that disappears and preserves it in a storage mechanism that also uses the velocity signal to move it along, then what happens is you've got the preserved fragment and the later visible fragment, and they are brought into register. So there's, there's really, um, some nasty geometry with that that I'm not going to bother you with. <clears throat> but we've actually proposed the dynamic visual icon, that this iconic storage we have, which has many types in vision, uh, one of these stores actually transports things you've seen that were moving after they're out of sight for some limited period of time. Now, I'm going to give you a little flavor of experiments here, because I haven't really so far. We're going to do an experiment where three fragments, it's always going to be fragments, goes behind an occluder, or as you'll see later, an illusory contour version. And then the subject is going to make a forced choice. Did you see the left set of fragments or the right? And what differs between these will always be a shift of, of one of the pieces. We're going to do this for relatable stimuli that meet contour relatability and space you temporally, because we're going to set this up with these staggered, very small slits to make sure there's no stationary image where you get contour relatability. So it's not spatial relatability, it's spatio-temporal because you get the parts over time. And then a second condition, we're gonna round those tangent discontinuities and see if that disrupts it. And we're also gonna permute them, which disrupts relatability. So these are separate manipulations that if object formation happens here, and crucially, if object formation makes you better at this spatial discrimination task, then we should see that in the data. <clears throat> here are the objects we use. You have to make the objects very carefully so you don't get any spatial interpolation. We want it to all be spatiotemporal, information gathered over time. And notice, by the way, just showing these object fragments, don't they want to be objects and they kind of create occluding strips in front of them? Yeah, anyway, that's relatability. Now, here's the carrier variable in this experiment. We're going to compare in the data this so-called zero misalignment with different amounts of misalignment. So this is five arc min of visual angle, 10, 15, 20. The task gets easier when you compare zero to 25 than when you compare zero to 10. Also, there's a twist that interpolation, uh, relatability uh, gets disrupted at about 15 to 20 minutes of visual angle. So that's another twist, but I'm not gonna go into that. Here's some examples, and please, I hope these videos play. Okay, this is a, a spatio-temporally uh, relatable um, occlusion case. 
Okay, did you see a nice well-formed object back there? Turns out that your brain putting that object together makes you better at the task that I just showed you, an objective performance task. Okay, now, how about the illusory contour? Back in the US, it is almost Halloween, and here All Saints Day. This is a spooky image for Halloween. I show it in perception classes around now. There's a ghostly image. And the still, the static views of these, you can see how we've kept much spatial relatability from going on. That object really isn't there in any view. It's, a, it's really interpolation. I like that one so much, I'm playing it one more time. Okay, I'm so glad the videos aren't jerky, it's good. Okay, now some of the controls. If we permute these fragments, oh, we're gonna take the top one and put it on the bottom and they're not relatable anymore. So you see three fragments and you should be able to get some idea of their spatial relationship, but you're much worse discriminating the spatial position of the fragments when you don't form an object. Here's the, the modal case. I am sorry it's taking me so long to get these strips to open. Okay, so there's a permuted fragments. You can see them, but they don't join as an object. And here's the rounded tangent discontinuities. Tell you what, I'm gonna take those on faith. Oh, here we go. Okay, and we enlarge the slits because if we round, we can't do the rounding without giving some more space. And here's the, the um, rounded illusory. Okay, yes. But, so you see the three, but they don't form an object. All right, here's some data. We're plotting D prime sensitivity for the discrimination between a pair, and we're plotting it uh, opposed to the opposite the carrier var var variable of between the zero misalignment and five, that's harder than 10, 15, 20, 25. So performance goes up in all conditions, uh, the easier the comparison gets. The relatable uh, displays are the best. This is all amodal. The rounded, it knocks it down. It doesn't completely destroy it, which we think are lower spatial frequency corners. So corners might appear in different spatial frequencies. It's a detail, don't worry about it. The permuted are much less good. Now for the modal illusory contour, it's the same pattern. And if we look at the um, relatable conditions, modal and amodal track very well. A little bit of a, a constant difference, but this is the kind of data that convinces us that empirically these look very similar, maybe not absolutely identical. As I said before, the identity hypothesis can't be decided just from empirical data, but certainly consistent. Here's the complicated math. I'm not gonna worry you with it, but just, uh, Qualitatively, if you have an edge that you see here, and then it goes behind an occluder, and its position gets updated because of its velocity signal, and gets to here when another edge here appears, if this is relatable, then spatio-temporal interpolation occurs. Okay, deep breath, I've seen a lot. We're coming to the last part. Uh, I've summarized a considerable body of research. There's clear evidence of a basic geometry and contour interpolation process that's quite general. Is that it? Does this solve all the problems in the field? Actually, we have a very contentious field and it does not. Many studies point to other influences on perceptual completion. First, I wanna say I'm not talking about this. So if you see the tail of your cat behind a, a piece of furniture, you say, ah, oh, the cat. That, in my view, is not perceptual completion. Your brain is not forming all the contours of the cat. In fact, you don't know where they are. Even with the head and the tail, you probably see those as connected in some metaphoric way, but they're not connected by contour relatability. By the way, in the psych review paper, we had this, I should have put it up here. We actually connected by relatability the head of the cat to a vase that appears at the bottom and the tail to another thing. So it, it uh, shows you the difference between these things. But this is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is perfectly relatable things like the outline square, like the edges of the outline square, whereas the filled square gives clear interpolated contours as Kanitsa and many people knew a long time ago, there's something bad about outlines. They give either weak or non-existent interpolation. <laughs> 
Here's a selection of some of the really interesting things many of my colleagues in the field have done. Uh, beautiful displays by he and Oi and their colleagues and experiments. On the left, you probably see a central ring that's formed by object formation. On the right, you have very similar inducers, but you don't see that ring very clearly. You can see, honestly, if, if we spent some time close up with it, you'd see some weak illusory contours, but something's really wrong on the right. What's the difference between left and right? Well, the bars that come out here are white, both white, both black, both white. These are opposite contrasts. So there's a problem there. These are all related. The, the elements that would form a central ring are relatable on the left and relatable on the right. It's not the whole story. Nice displays by Barbara Gillum. Uh, when you line up inducing elements and thin lines induce contour interpolation perpendicular to them, unless you put funny points on them and then it goes away. But this little strip here doesn't have very strong illusory contours. When you make the lines more chaotic, now you see a little strip there. So what's that about? They're both relatable. And finally, from our lab, uh, Susan Kerrigan, this display has competition. Uh, the bottom edge on the right could attach to either, the, uh, either of these upper right edges. But if we do that, <clears throat> it looks now that the left-hand edge wins the competition. It forms part of a familiar object, and it clo it's a closed figure, and the right-hand edge is out in the cold. So what's going on? These are all things where relatability isn't deciding it. We've outlined contour relatability, which seems to be an automated modular perceptual mechanism. It vetoes interpolation beyond certain limits. It's not very sensitive to making sense, like putting together different color of fragments. But these other scene constraints are sensitive to border ownership, consistent surface properties, higher level influences that strengthen or weaken interpolation. They're, they're all about making sense. So what's going on here? We've argued, going back a long way, there's really two processes here. There's a basic contour linking process that's pretty much necessary for these kinds of interpolation to occur. And then there's scene constraints that amplify or weaken or even delete some of those contours. So here's how this looks. <clears throat> From the image, we see this representation. We get these areas of surface color and shape. Uh, well, actually not. This is the physical stimulus, sorry. We do edge filtering and junction filtering. We get a map of edges and junctions. We implement contour relatability, and we get these crossing interpolations in this map. And then various scene constraints tell us which of these survive and which are, are not going to survive. For example, this oval and this triangle are actually relatable, but they don't get connected, this edge of the half circle and the outline figure. So some things don't, don't make it in the final representation, but at the same time, you've got an object here that's occluded, transparent, and, uh, and other things on the way down. So there's a problem with just saying this. Oh, well, there's a second stage, and it works out all the problems that relatability doesn't handle. That's not what we're doing. And I'm, I'm going to show you some fairly new evidence today about that. Um, some of the earlier evidence, though, suggested this might be going on. The dreaded outlines that don't give very clear contours, if you put them in an objective paradigm called the fat-thin paradigm, where you're judging whether these circles are a little bit turned inward or outward to make the width wider or thinner, uh, I'm not going to go through the data, but these give you the performance advantages similar to what you get from filled surfaces. Also, a, a process called classification imaging shows these interpolated contours are driving your responses, even with outlines. So how can we make this a little more substantive? Can we find a pure case? Well, some of my vision colleagues may be surprised that I'm going to suggest a pure case has been hiding in plain sight. This is the so-called path paradigm. It's a beautiful paradigm by Field, Hayes, and Hess. We're going to call this a path. These little elements seem to be in a chain. They're somehow grouped. 
In the PATH experiment, we'll show you a field of a lot of these elements. These are little Gabor patches. And in a two interval forced choice, one interval will have a path, the other will just have noise. <clears throat> so you're supposed to say which one had the path. It turns out that you are very good at detecting these paths if they follow the kind of relations that these elements have. These turn out to be exactly the mathematics of contour relatability. So path detection follows relatability. But there's a problem. These aren't interpolated contours that we perceive because path integration is another is the name made up for these. The paths may have a unity of some sort, but they don't give rise to interpolated edges. We don't see continuous edges connecting the elements. You can see there's no illusory contours, there's no occluded contours. Our hypothesis is that path integration phenomena are based on this initial contour linking interpretation in an in intermediate representation. And that intermediate representation can be accessed for some tasks or is picked up by some of these tasks. Here's a clue of why, why we might believe that. There's, there's a contour linking in the intermediate representation on the left, but something blocks it from being full-fledged perceived continuous contours. But we can do some enhancements. If we occlude the gaps, now you see a partly occluded string. And if we hollow out the middle of these Gabor patches, so they match, they, there's a surface quality that can extend from one element to the other, now we see illusory contours. So it's the probably the fact that Gabor patches have their own coloration. You might have contour linking in an intermediate representation, but what would be the object? What is the surface that's enclosed by these contours? The system balks at that, and you don't see it in the final representation. OK, so how do we get at this experimentally? We're going to study this kind of question about scene constraints that come after the intermediate representation with four types of elements. Ordinary Gabors, we're going to hollow out the Gabors and get uh, not great, but, but illusory contours. We're going to make the Gabors have step edges, abrupt contours. And we're going to have uh, Gabors with step edges and match the surround. So we're going to manipulate that surface constraint to see if you have a surface constraint that's amenable and contour linking in the intermediate representation if you get, um, if you get perception of illusory contours. So these are the four elements. And we're going to study their misalignment. So misaligned parallels have a tolerance of about 15 to 20 minutes of visual angle I mentioned earlier. It's a separate line of research. And we're going to do two paradigms. We're going to do the path paradigm with all four of these element types. And we're going to do a perception of illusory contours with magnitude estimation. So the two interval force choice, which, had, which display had a path? Here's the first bit of news. All four of these element types are essentially the same. This is path detection, accuracy is high. It declines to about, at about 15, 20 minutes of visual angle, it hits a plateau. This is very much what Field, Hayes, and Hess found for angular relations and relatability. This adds misalignment of parallel segments. But it doesn't matter whether you have that surface agreement from the modified Gabors or the regular Gabors, in fact, the step edge with the gray center should be the best one, and it's, I think, the worst one. These are roughly the same. Path integration, that first stage of contour interpolation, doesn't care about these other scene constraints. It's an automatic mechanism. But do we see illusory contours in these displays? We do a rating procedure from zero to five, we again look at it as a function of misalignment. And we see for the two types that have surfaces that can agree with the surround, so that if you interpolated the contours in stage one, you would have some surface to enclose with your illusory contours. So these two give you higher, very respectable illusory contour ratings. 
But notice those illusory contour ratings drop down and disappear around 15 to 20 minutes of arc. That's because they depend on that first contour linking stage, which is going away by that point. But the other two kind of displays, although they act the same in path detection, they never give you illusory contours. So they're all linked the same way in stage one. The evidence here suggests if another constraint is fulfilled, then you actually see continuous contour connections. So path integration provides an important uh, missing link. Now, this is closely reasoned, and, and I'm happy to discuss with you if I didn't make all the logic clear. But briefly, the spatial manipulations that disrupt path detection also disrupt illusory contour perception because both depend on the same underlying linked contour re representation. <clears throat> but only those displays that satisfy an additional constraint produce perceived contours connecting the elements. And contour linking in the intermediate representation is necessary but not sufficient for continuous contours. Okay, now there's still a bit of vagueness here. If we talk about scene constraints, what are we gonna say about that to make it more specific? There's a lot of demos in the literature, but we've tried to quantify these recently and I'm gonna go pretty fast here because I want, we wanna to get to the end of this. But we use the idea that what paradigm might pick up the second outputs of the second stage? And we thought recognition would. Have a look at this picture. And I'm gonna ask you, which of these two pieces was in the picture you saw? And you probably have no idea. But actually, This little part of the cow's head is the piece on the left. You didn't recognize it because patches in the image are not what the brain takes to recognition. Whole objects are. If I had put the whole cow's head, you would have gotten it. So we're gonna use that. We're gonna exploit this paradigm by Bregman, 2001, who showed that it's harder to recognize the letter B from these fragments than it is with these occluders. So our task is detect a letter or number in the display. We have various fragments, but only one complete fragment. Here you see the number two, and we are timing people to do that. And this is all written up, not all written up, but written up in a recent chapter in the book Sensory Individuals that just came out. Our paradigm is to show a fixation point, the mask, the occluder where there's an occluder, um, and then the uh, particular manipulation of a character and then a mask. Okay, what I wanted to um, say is the canonical display, the best it can be, is when you have fragments of the same color, appropriate occlusion, and so on. But we test the removal of each of these factors by jumbling the occluder, by changing the contrast polarity. Let me see that. By changing the contrast polarity and so forth. And I'm gonna sum this up very briefly, but say, tell you that each of these factors that detracts from the canonical display is an important scene constraint that's been implicated in weaker or sometimes deleting uh, otherwise linked contours. When we do this, we find out how much a factor decreases. This is performance as time increases. Canonical display here, here's the manipulated one. And what we find is that these constraints operate in a simple additive fashion. <clears throat> so here we change from having an occluder and um, having same contrast polarity to opposite polarity and no occluder. And that is the combination of each of those factors individually. If you actually take this decrement and add it to this decrement, you'd get this predicted curve. And for most of these factors, it comes out almost exactly. This is the observed, right on, pretty much right on top of the predicted. The second stage is not a vague hand wave. It's a bunch of scene constraints, each of which has an, uh, a, um, an action, and they seem to interact in an additive fashion. So just to conclude, understanding contour interpolation requires at least a two process model. That basic stage of contour linking is necessary but the appearance of link contours, whether they get to perception at all, depends on these other constraints that act in an additive fashion. This account helps us to understand and relate a number of phenomena. And from a theory point of view, 
theories of automated perceptual mechanisms, which I said I would always like to find, they go so far, but they only go so far. Other constraints look like they're interacting in a constraint satisfaction way, in an additive fa fashion, maybe involving past experience, maybe involving global symmetry, lots of other things. So it's a hybrid in the end. And sorry for going that long. These are some of my collaborators. Questions, right, Bill? Yes. Yep. But then you have something else to tell. Not a lot prepared, but uh, I took some of the personal stuff out. And if people want to ask questions okay. about, you know, how I started to look at perception this way, besides reading Kanitsa, talk about that. Go to the audience for questions about this uh, presentation, systematic presentation. David. Well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. It was a beautiful uh, seminar. Um, so one question that uh, I have uh, concerns what you mentioned briefly about uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning, right? So as we know nowadays, there are these artificial systems which are extremely good at performing some visual tasks like image classification, for example. I wonder how much uh, do, you, do you think uh, uh, the artificial science community should try to now implement this sort of test on artificial system to see how similar or how different they are in terms of processing shapes and objects, because you know, they may converge to the same solution by using very different strategies, right? And so now a real question is, are they using the same strategies that we use, for example, by relying on pattern completion or, or what you have been describing, right? This is a great question, and actually, kind of gets at the one idea I wanted to make sure to point out in the second part. Let's, let's go ahead and do this. So you're asking, I think, about deep learning systems. I want to point out for people who do this kind of work that the world has become uh, very ripe uh, for the importance of what we do because a lot of that trajectory from the gestaltus to modern computational accounts of human perception emphasize that we get explicit representations in the end. We represent contours. It has a location. It has a curvature. We represent shape. We represent figure and ground. Deep learning systems, which can perform certain visual tasks very well, such as image classification from the ImageNet database, they're doing this in a much different way. And in some work, that we've, uh, so first of all, some of our work has emphasized the abstraction of shape representations, why you would see a horse in a cloud. I mean, on a Bayesian view, there are no horses in the clouds, but there it is, you're seeing it. The deep learning systems, when we tested them in a variety of different ways, uh, we found they don't have any, any access to global shape. Uh, we did a lot of ways, but I think the most fun are these glass figurines. I always wanted to do this. So if you show the, system of goose made of glass, it comes up with the correct label with a probability of 0.006. There's a thousand categories in the ImageNet database. So um, 0.01 is, I think, no, I'm sorry, 0.1 is chance in this database. 0.1% is chance. Um, this these are several, VGG16, AlexNet, others, thinks less than chance that this is a goose, but thinks it's 10% likely this is a website. It also could be a corkscrew or a hook. For this fox, system does not think it's a fox, but it could be a chain, a whistle, or a hair side. So what's going on here? These systems trained from millions of images can use anything, the exact pixels, they're much better at recording exact pixels than we would be, but they're not getting global shape. They can do local shape properties like orientation, but it's the relations that frustrate them. In further work in a, a paper that's just come out, this is in PLOS Computational Biology a few years ago, 
But in work that's just come out in Frontier's Artificial Intelligence, we show that the problem is bigger. It's not just shape, it's relations. So whereas humans explicitly represent shape, relations, uh, and so forth, these systems don't do that. So they can't, they have a very hard time with same different. They can learn whether two objects are the same or different if you keep showing them the same objects. But as soon as you, ge you generalize, so here's two new objects, are they the same? That's no idea. And a number of other relations. So systems that don't have explicit abstract representations of reality can still be trained as classifiers, but they're not gonna do what we do. And the way we do it is probably important for using our representations from perception for multiple tasks. Or as one computer vision person put it, uh, you might wanna use caution giving full control of your self-driving car to a device that has no meaningful concept of what a solid object is. So that would be my, my answer. Thanks. Great talk, Phil. This was amazing. Um, I, <clears throat> I'm not sure that I have a very specific my question formulated in my brain, but um, I'm, I'm just wondering, so this uh, re relatability is basically um, some sort of geometrical alignment in space-time, right? If you consider spatial and space-time and the, the, the movement uh, completion. Um, I'm just wondering that um, if this kind of relatability can be extended in other dimensions. So for example, um, across surfaces where you have um, uh, correlations across space, maybe across space and time, of uh, properties like spatial frequency or other properties that uh, define uh, a surface, a continuous surface. So I'm just wondering if that is also something that can be considered um, in conjunction with the relat relatability to solve this problem of object segregation, perceptual organization. That's a mind expanding question. So I, my immediate response would be, I don't know, but one would be looking for some dimension of smooth change, and, uh, and there may well be such things, but there won't be smooth change of orientation in space as with contours and surfaces. But it's, it's, it's a, as I say, a mind-expanding question. I'll think about it. Let me know what you think. Question? Um, so I guess my question is, is really about the way you set up the problem mm -hmm. at the beginning of your talk. Which, by the way, I, I thought it, it, it was extremely well done. It was very clear, very compelling. Uh, so um, it, it works, okay? Uh, especially in a context like this. But uh, something that always uh, <clears throat> bugs me when, when I hear the problem of completion presented in that way, which is the following. Um, you are essentially telling us, uh, okay, you've got an image and there's fragments in this image, and some something or somebody or some entity must uh, do this interpolation to reconstruct uh, something, an object from these fragments, which works again. But uh, it seems to me that th this way of setting the problem, um, I don't know. There's there's always something that uh, I've. I've uh, that's, that's missing in this picture because if you really take it to the extreme consequences, right? You're essentially trying to say on your retina you have these fragments, and then you have to do the reconstruction. Then you should also uh, uh, really be honest about what's going on on the retina. On the retina, not only you have those fragments, but if you consider just one instant in time, which uh, as you seem to suggest, with Heights, um, 
then you have to admit that on the retina, you also have a very tiny part, which is really high resolution, where you can see the details uh, of the uh, of the contours. And essentially, almost all everything else on the retina, 99% of the, of the retina is low resolution, blurry. And uh, on top of that, uh, you also have blind spot. Uh, and uh, on top of that, you have all sorts of retina. Well, you know. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, it's a question for you. I'm, I'm really wondering what your thoughts are about this. You know, why do we as vision scientists choose to ignore all of this when we set up the problem and uh, just accept, yeah, there is an image with fragments. Where is this image with fragments? It's never, there's never an image like that on the retina, really. I, I think it's a, a really interesting question, but I, I think what you're saying actually agrees more with the approach than it might seem at first. In the first place, I'm not saying that we get the snapshot of fragments and then we assort them. The Gestaltists talked about proximity and similarity, and they, they had the very elements that didn't, you know, that we weren't supposed to believe in in the first place, and you had to group them. So there's, I always felt there's a little paradox there. I don't want to be committing the same paradox. I, I think what's um, what's the idea that spans the way you're describing it and the way I'm describing it is um, is an idea that comes a little bit from David Marr that perception has tasks. There's there's things we're trying to do. Not a little guy in the head, but the system has evolved so that we want to know about surfaces of support and we want to know if uh, a surface continues behind the trees and what object is there. So what we're trying to do is extract the relations in space and time that will give us access to those things. But I didn't mean to imply that we get a, a mosaic of fragments and then have to assemble them. Although there are aspects that are like that. I mean, there are pieces, there is Im information that's coming that's discontinuous across the, the optical projection. But the examples you gave are actually, I think, very favorable for this, this approach. And the idea that the, the visual system does have this task. Uh, across the blind spot, we don't see the blind spot. The visual system completes across that. We don't see holes in the surfaces or a hole that moves around when our eyes move around. Uh, likewise, um, when Grossberg uh, and colleagues first started to Describe their theory of um, of the boundary contour system. Uh, they talked about going across gaps, not for illusory contours, but because of retinal veins, as you're as you're pointing out. So it looks like wherever we see these kinds of obstructions to getting at the surface in the world, the object in the world, the visual system is is making these moves to to uh, get around it or get get the information despite that. And the, the motion stuff is the most amazingly compelling because it's changing all the time. You saw what's happening in one location on the eye, but your system is having none of it. It does not want to record all those little specks in one area. It wants to grab the fire truck that's going through. Uh, but the other part you said is something that vision scientists should think about more. And I know the people in crowding do. And it's that this trick about assembling meaningful shapes and bounded objects is probably not happening way out here in the periphery. It's happening foveally and parafoveally. And this means that uh, probably the processes I'm describing are more or less confined there, depending on how large you know, the surfaces and objects are. Uh, but we, we get that, as, uh, as some have argued, by, by scanning. So we look in, in this place, in this place, in this place, and <clears throat> through yet a different kind of representation, we're stitching together this uh, idea that the world extends throughout what we have as a visual field. Because you know we don't get color out here in the periphery and we don't uh, probably do these interpolation processes equally well everywhere. Uh, so I'm not at all adverse to the idea that there's some confinement of these processes based on acuity. Does that help? Oh, one more question on my side. I guess uh, um, I'm curious to know how much of what we have been showing about the human vision is actually shared uh, with other species, perhaps very different from us. I mean, how much uh, uh, evolution has actually pushed primates uh, toward being able to do this sort of counter completion? 
as opposed perhaps to other species that can go from you know lower mammals to invertebrates, right? I don't know how much you can tell about this. Well, I can't say that all these things have been looked at with other species, but some have. And um, it looks like the interpolation processes we're talking about are cross species, uh, with the exception of pigeons, who seem to be very stubborn. But uh, Regulin and Dewey Artigara have done lovely work uh, with chicks and uh, Fujita with primates. And actually, Fujita reviews a number of species, again, pointing out the pigeons are, are just not. For pigeons, pigeons may be neural networks. Take it, that's, my, that's my hypothesis. Um, but uh, there is some cross-species uh, effects of this. Whether this two-stage part and the, the constraints that may be coming in um, as multiple constraint satisfaction or as learning and so forth, I'm not, I, I don't think there's any evidence either way about that. Otherwise, I give you the word again for okay. the second part. Well, you you were so you. you were so indulgent with me to go that long. I didn't know it was going to be that long. Um, but the second part I was told about recently is that something a little more personal in the second half. And um, I think, especially given the last question, I I, I tie the answers to some of those things um, with theoretical orientation. Um, but I will tell you that, as Walter mentioned, I began, um, actually I began my career in experimental psychology. I went to grad school thinking I wanted to study attention. And this, the reason I wanted to study attention and humans only was that I had done a lot of um, animal psychology as an undergraduate, putting pigeons in boxes and handling rats and the rats will turn around and bite you. And, oh, it's terrible. Anyway. Uh, but then I never studied attention. I studied reasoning as a model of, uh, a sort of logic as a model of human reasoning. But when I discovered perception in one of my courses, especially uh, some questions with infants, we were off and running. And, you know, based on the work we did um, in infant perception, we really, I have to say, I hope this isn't too pompous, but we really put an end to a couple of centuries of speculation that humans are born with raw sensations and they have to learn their way to an understanding of reality. And, and Fulvio Domini gave a great talk today where he's taking on this view in 3D perception. It's just the wrong view. Um, if you look at other species, some are precocial in perception, which means they're advanced from the beginning. Humans are, are uh, altricial, which means they have a delayed perception, but it's coming in mostly by maturation. For example, stereo comes in at about 16 weeks in humans. It goes from not being there at all to being adult-like in a period of two, three weeks. Quite amazing. It tracks conceptual age, age from conception, better than it tracks age since birth. Uh, so this is maturation. And most human uh, faculties in visual perception are like this. Face perception can be shown very, very early. Orientation. Um, uh, object perception, distance, size, and so forth. So this made a profound uh, impact. And we've actually, w along with Martha Arterbury, we've written two versions of a book on infant perception, The Cradle of Knowledge. I recommend it. Uh, it really reviews the research in all these areas. And human perception rests on evolutionary foundations. And uh, there is some learning. There's a lot of calibration. And there's a lot of degeneration if you don't use perceptual faculties. But it's, it looks like evolution that gave you a finger and thumb and fingers that would let you pick up an object also gave you perceptual mechanisms that could grasp relations in the input to give you meaningful descriptions of reality. And this is a big change. It's already, you know, 30 years or so uh, in the past. But when people discovered methods of studying infant perception, a lot of this was put to rest. And some people had studied perception in animals, realized that the old story didn't make much sense anyway. Mountain goats are locomotive from birth. They can move up and down the mountain. They never fall off the mountain. They never seem to have trouble with the third dimension. They never have a world that seems, as Barclay said, to be painted on the retina or in the mind. 
they, and have to learn the third dimension. They just know it. They just see it, and they pass the visual cliff, you know, on day one. Humans don't pass the visual cliff on day one because they don't move, but they can see. And so this changed the story, and also the orientation that comes from people like uh, Mishat, Kanitsa, Gibson, is that perception is about meaningful things. It's not about little bits and pieces. So these, this is my orientation, and um, I come by it. I don't know if any of this has. Um, um, my lineage, uh, the infant perception research was done with Spelke, with Elizabeth Spelke. Uh, I had a class my first year where I had these consuming questions about how infants receive. We had nobody at the University of Pennsylvania who studied those. And then that year we hired Liz Spelke and took these questions and she told me all about these methods and had her own questions and it was good. But this is a lineage that goes to the Gibsons because Elizabeth Spelke's committee in graduate school was J.J. Gibson, Eleanor Gibson, and Ulrich Neisser. Um, but from the very time I got into this, and especially having done infant perceptual research, I firmly committed to looking at perceptual mechanisms probably there as a result of evolution. And if there's something else, like the depth cue of familiar size is learned, so there are things that are something else. If there's something else, that's important too. But, you know, I tend to fall back on what Gibson said on, in well-lit environments with two eyes and the observer and a moving observer, we get a lot of information that specifies what's out there. And so the goal of research should be find that information and find the mechanisms. Uh, I'm much more process and representation oriented than say Gibson would be, but those are the goals. And I just want to say, because there's young people here, it's so hard to maintain this view that I'm discussing in the face of the current zeitgeist. Um, we have, um, I don't know if this works. So the classical empiricist views, which now are reflected in contemporary Bayesian views, we see objects because of a long learning history, lets us interpret sensory input. Well, we don't start with sensory input. We start with perceptual mechanisms. And a lot of the contemporary Bayesian view is coming out of uh, computer vision, and especially to be optimal in decisions. But remember, when you use priors to influence perception in your model, the priors aren't perception, they're memory, they're stored information from some other day. And if the world's changing, they won't be right. There's a lot of problems. I love, in Fulvio's talk today, he sort of asked, well, where do we get the truth to the truth data for these priors? If perception relies on priors, how, who told us the right answer about certain um, probabilities in the first place? So, so that's really hard, but it's very persistent. Now we have a deep learning view, which is also very learning oriented. Well, maybe the brain is just one big multi-layer network. And so you could train a device on millions of input images and tell it for the problems I've been discussing, which parts are connected in each image. And then maybe it would evolve something like interpolation and object formation. Although I will tell you, we've published two papers on illusory contours in deep learning, and they don't see, those systems don't see illusory contours. But you can kind of, there's training, you could kind of tell them the answer, and they would, um, which is a problem there. But these are, again, extreme learning views. But I would encourage, as a prototype for looking at perception, uh, something like structure from motion. So imagine I show you a field of dots that's stationary. And in a, a wonderful video I had, I wish I could show it to you, from Jack Loomis years ago, there's a field of dots doing nothing. And if I ask you, this is not Jack's part, but I would ask, what are your priors for what these dots are? The, I'm going to say the dots are going to go into motion. They're going to move. What is it? Is it a rabbit? Is it a uh, helicopter? And then the dots move. And what you see is a rotating cube. And inside it, rotating a different way, is kind of a, a Mexican hat. So you see two objects, one transparent, you see the other, you see these perfectly well-formed objects. And this is all from motion relations of moving dots on a flat two-dimensional screen. Your brain is this tremendous geometer that knows from these relations, complicated relations in motion, uh, 
what solid objects are being specified or transparent solid objects are being specified. Now that's amazing. And it has nothing to do with priors or the probability distribution of things you saw last week or things your ancestors saw in evolution. It has everything to do with information. So I highly recommend anchoring approaches to perception uh, on phenomena like that. But that, uh, it's a biased view and I'm giving you my view. Thank you. General conclusion. Yeah, David. Maybe I just want to, to add a comment in favor of using computational approaches like deep learning or deep neural networks. I'm so having a little trouble here. I, I would like to add, uh, uh, let's say, some, uh, uh, some consideration in favor of actually using tools like uh, machine vision approaches or like you know, deep, deep neural networks to study perception. And one big advantage of these, of these approaches that, uh, as uh, my mentor Jim DiCarlo says, is that they are, they are image computable. So these are models that, uh, make quantitative predictions. They do process images and spin out uh, some output that then uh, can be uh, compared in terms of whether it is classification performance or whatever it is to what, for example, a human or a monkey or whatever species does, right? So I think that uh, we cannot ignore the fact that these systems uh, are doing something important also in the field of uh, perceptual sciences because uh, they have this property of being image computable that is the real boxes in which you can put input stuff and produce an output. And you know, they are an instantiation, a computational instantiation of, of theories that uh, sometime in cognitive sciences remain a little bit vague, right? A, bit, a little bit written in words rather than in computation. So I don't know what you think about that. Well, I think models in cognitive science and in experimental psychology are very, are very um, precise and rigorous, or it can be, and some problems aren't quite there yet, they do the best they can. Um, it, it's hard from a machine vision side, if somebody makes a complete model from image up um, that does uh, a certain task, it usually contains so many uh, different assumptions and commitments, it would be hard to test empirically. So uh, experimental psychologists in cognitive science have the task of saying whether this is really the way it happens. So they, they, they tend to unbundle some of these pieces. Uh, but I hope that nothing I said means I'm against machine vision. Uh, not only am I a fan, uh, but in some other work we do in perceptual learning, I actually think the pickup of subtle regularities where people can't consciously express, you know, what the radiologist is seeing or, or how uh, an expert distinguishes two breeds of dogs and things. I think the um, deep learning in particular is a much better model for part of that. But there's also, I just don't want the abstraction and symbolic representation that is also part of human perception. I don't want that to get lost uh, because it's in danger of getting lost. And uh, um, so we're, it's, it's going to be both. And I'll tell you what, for deep learning systems in particular, and I'm not sure if your question, because it was a little hard to hear you, but I wasn't sure if your question is coming up more out of deep learning in machine vision or Bayesian kinds of things. Okay, deep learning. So when the deep learning systems do the massively powerful um, development of connection weights based on training and get a symbolic architecture in there to pick up relations, start looking not only for, in, for pixel properties, but for some relational properties, they are going to be truly formidable. Uh, they're gonna be more like us, but they're gonna have capacity to do image properties that we can't, we can't pick up, re remember, encode, or express. Uh, although we have some of that, but I think the combination is is a very promising way forward, Poss possibly as a model of what we do, and and also a very good model for artificial devices. I'm glad you asked because I, I didn't want to seem like an opponent of, of that stuff. Absolutely. 
I would like to add a general comment to your last uh, slide and to the title of your talk. In terms of uh, uh, general perceptual theory, uh, you should remember that we are in some sense in the context of the Gestalt uh, theory plays. And Gestalt theory uh, was something different in this respect, in respect of form perception. Because basically the problem of fr fragments to objects is the problem of form perception. Instead of perceiving the shape of fragments, and Nicola was pointing to this, you perceive a different shape, which is uh, uh, different in a profound sense. It takes uh, pieces and you have something new. But in this formulation, uh, you, you limit yourself to the geometric aspect of the problem. Gestalt theory was pointing to a different aspect also, not only to the geometry of the situation, but uh, uh, was trying to, at least some Gestalt uh, theorists, uh, instead of having just a geometric approach to the problem of shape perception, you should also have a dynamic approach in the sense that you have properties that go beyond the simple mapping from fragments to objects. And it is the problem captured by the notion of good gestalt. Some shapes are better or look better to observers than others. And this has nothing, so to speak, to do with the problem of putting pieces together. Why some shapes look better than others? Also in situations when there is nothing to put together. It's not the problem of pieces. Why a circle looks better than a deformation of a circle or a circle without a little piece? Uh, and the intuition that some Gestalt people had is that this sense of goodness is in some sense related to the interpolation problem. When we talk about uh, smoothness and monotonicity, we are talking about constraints that imply a, kind, a sense of quality of shape. Why smooth shapes are better than non-smooth shapes or interrupted? Why? And this was the basic problem. Uh, maybe pregnancy is not the right answer yeah? uh, in the, the Fuller's sense of the feeling states. Uh, but the problem uh, was well posed, I think. Perception does not only reflect, I mean, form perception in vision, does not reflect only geometrical aspects, but also something else, which is the quality of the result, so to speak. And there are differences. We perceive differences in the quality. We have a sense of order and sense of disorder, and there is a preference for order, the range, which is in some sense related to the problem of why we put fragments together. And we don't limit ourselves to perceive fragments, which would be easier. So why don't we get just fragments? The answer, Gestalt uh, gave an answer because it is simpler. Uh, so there is a direction in the process. And uh, I think this is an original way of putting the problem, uh, a very original way of looking at the problem. Still, I think uh, we don't have a, a, a good uh, uh, answer to a well posed problem. Yes? Well, uh, <clears throat> if I could come. Yes, I'm. Um, I've always been intrigued by the dynamics, the field forces in Gestalt psychology. Um, <clears throat> two impediments. Well, I'll tell you three impediments. The first one was early in my career, as I was at Swarthmore College, Hans Volick was still doing research, and he had come over as Curler's assistant. And the story we heard was that. Kerr, who believed, who originated some of these dynamic field forces ideas, um, he really believed that he could get some good experimental evidence by using something called figural after effects. 
And what they were going to do was wire up Curler's brain. Uh, and while he's looking at these figures and the figure after effects, Volick was the assistant who's going to turn up the power, the, 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 the amp, the voltage. And um, Curler was very demanding, apparently. I never, I never met him. But there was a very formidable picture of him up on the wall in a lounge in my, in my building. There. But um, as, as Hans would tell it, um, Curler would shout at him, I'm not seeing it, turn it up, turn it up. And uh, Volk said, no, it's get the dangerous level, turn it up, turn it up. And so I don't think the prediction ever came true, but what happened was Curler blacked out and for some days afterwards, he had lost half of his visual field. <laughs> so don't do this experiment. Uh, so I was gonna say there are three impediments for me, uh, even though I'm very sympathetic to field force ideas, that we, the first one would be don't do that. The second is how do we model these, especially as we, we think either about um, physical processes in the brain, you know, the idea of a general electromagnetic medium, that, that doesn't seem to be a current one. Maybe some neural network sorts of things, there could be equilibria and, and <clears throat> such things. Um, it's hard to get a handle on. And for and for me, but I'm very interested in what what you know possibilities there are. The third for me, though, is having been very influenced by ecological theories. And here I would equally credit Gibson and Marr. You know, and Gibson worked with Kafka for part of his, his work. I can only imagine their conversations. For Gibson, it's all about seeing the world accurately. And for Kafka, it might be the simplest possible representation, prognans and so forth. Those two are not always the same, but I'm very convinced that perception as influenced by evolution is trying to get us, we can't say veridical or exactly the right answer, but as close to the right answer as we can. And um, it's hard to see that that's a match for simplicity principles, even if we could um, implement them. Sometimes it is, sometimes it might not be. And also, um, it just seems a more um, overarching goal of perception would be to, to get it right. But I remain very, very intrigued. How do, you, how do you see modeling dynamic field forces? How do you see kind of getting it into some of the language of contemporary brain descriptions or or computational descriptions, or, or or a different kind of description. I can give you this. Sure. Of course, I think that the uh, the force field application of the uh, goodness problem is uh, uh, is just one. You know, maybe, unfortunately. A gestalt uh, uh, theory, especially Keller, used the isomorphism as the tool to approach the goodness problem, mm. goodness of <clears throat> shape. But this is just one way. And I also heard this terrible story from Hans when I visited Baltimore. So I was very much impressed and I, I told the people about that. But the, this was the character of uh, Killer. The problem was the character of Claire, who was uh, uh, willing to, so convinced of his idea that there are electrical fields in the brain that are the physical implementation of dynamic field that he had in mind. That was the problem. Uh, but we can be totally free, forget about that, uh, and still uh, appreciate the fact that that perception includes a sense of goodness of shapes. That's, mm -hmm. that's the connection between aesthetics and simply geometry. There is uh, this connection. We should not forget about that mm -hmm. because there is a whole field about the preferences for shapes. And in the small field that we are talking about, the field of interpolation, smoothness is, so you can give an ecological uh, uh, interpretation of smooth, arguing that uh, most contours in the field, in the visual field, belong to objects that have smooth contours. This, still, I resist a little bit this idea. 
maybe this is not the right answer. Maybe mm. there is something else. There is a, a, an inner constraint which is not dependent on the outside world. But it is a good coincidence. Oh. It's a very good coincidence. Let me try this. You're just making me realize uh, Nicholas Baker and I have published several papers, and there'll be more, about the representations of contours. So when I think of goodness, as you're talking about, certainly aesthetics is one question, but then also what drives that. But even it's apart from perception, you know, of finding what's out there, we have to remember that whatever we pick up, detect, we have to represent. And it's our representations that may have some big simplicity commitments. So for example, we have a lot of evidence now that the way contours are represented is in terms of constant curvature primitives. And maybe the convergence with your ideas is there. There's something special about constant curvature. In a neural model that we're working on, you can make these out of linked oriented units of constant turning angle. And there's some amazing phenomena that come out and, and some other fMRI work, it's not our work, uh, that suggests um, constant curvature is very special. And we have, uh, from several different paradigms, evidence that even though a contour may be something that doesn't have any constant curvature, we are forcing it into a representation of constant curvature segments that if you have enough segments, it's pretty good. It, it, services, it serves all our purposes, but it may actually may be, I, I'm intrigued by your question because I, I, I like to think more about simplicity as a mandate of the representations uh, and maybe the core of what our representations are. Now, I, the Gestaltists, I don't know if they were representational. Gibson hated the idea of, he was more of a behaviorist stimulus and, and act, complex stimulus and complex action. but. Um, but I think most of us believe in representations, but there's a lot to think about there. We thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. What is it? Thank you. Uh, and let me close with a, a small announcement. It's about the possibility. Let's say uh, it's still a possibility, but next year, the Canisa lecture, uh, it's likely, uh, will be likely part of the, uh, the Gestalt theory uh, conference in Milan, uh, like it happened in Trieste ago. Uh, and probably there will also be a workshop connected to uh, the Canisa lecture uh, on a topic that I cannot anticipate, but uh, that is theoretically very stimulating. So I invite you to uh, keep an eye uh, to our website for an announcement uh, in probably in late September next year, we'll have uh, another edition of the Kansa lecture. We are already working on that uh, to continue this uh, tradition. I think that we were really lucky this year to have uh, Phil with this uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, we thank you again for coming from far away to illuminate. Thank you. Well, thank you.